Father, our goal this morning is to understand your word, understand how we can be successful, Lord God, so that we can organize our lives around how we can be successful. There's no human being that doesn't want to be successful. It's, it's, it's just in us to do so. You want us to be successful. We want to be successful. But Father, to want to be and to know how to be are two separate things. I pray that you would just allow for us to instruct so that we can learn today how to connect to you, the true source of success, so that this year can be greater than any other. Father, we're looking for this year to be the greatest year of our lives. I pray, Lord God, that we can connect to you, that you and your word abide in us, that we can bear forth much fruit be your disciples. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. And I, I read a news article and they did a poll and uh, I told the group this morning and the poll says that the number one sentiment about 2016 around the nation is that everybody's just glad it's over. And they were looking forward for 2017 so that they can start new. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how the Lord in Genesis chapter 1, he says that he's given us the moon and the sun and the stars, not just for light and for energy and all those things, but for signs and for seasons so that we can start anew every year. It's not just something in your head that says that things are starting new for you. It's also in the stars. It, it, is, it is in God's overall program that today we start anew. So I decided to start new, anew, and I decided to, um, to quit all of my bad habits for 2017. And then I realized that nobody likes a quitter, so I decided to, you know. <laughs> and so we have resolutions. Listen, we, we know it's time, y'all. It's time. It's time. It's time. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, this year is the year that you're going to the next level. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise. There's a war going on. Is that right? And it's not a war where your eyes can see it. But it's a spiritual warfare. The scripture said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and all sorts of spiritual wickedness in high places. Then the Bible said if you want to win, you got to put on the whole armor of God. Is that right? The sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, your feet prepared with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There's a war going on. And if you want to win, put on the whole armor of God. Sister Lynette Hawkins Stevens. Amen. There's a war going on. Okay, say you got a little bit too much right now. Okay, you're a little bit too successful, and you don't want to be as successful. You know what you need to do? You need to change some habits. 
You need to throw a few bad habits <laughs> into your life because you're just too successful right now. Okay, or if you want to be more successful, okay, you need to change the, the habits that you are currently exercising. To get more, you have to add or take away foundational habits that you have established in your life. One has once said, when you sow a thought, when you plant a, sow a thought, you reap a deed. When you sow a deed, you reap a habit, and when you sow a habit, you reap a destiny. See, you are the sum total of your habits. What does your life look like? What do you want your life to look like? Think in terms of daily habits, not results. Okay, in other words, I want my life to look like a million dollars. A million dollars doesn't look like anything. That's not the way you think, okay? My life looked like a bank account number. That's not what your life looks like. That's just, that's just a bank account number. That's not your life. That's a result, okay? Don't look at results. Look at your process. What does your life look like as far as your daily process? Because if you have a million dollars, okay, it, it will be a result of a habitual process. Make the corn. All the farmer does is provides the environment yeah. Yeah. that once he puts that seed in the ground, the environment that he puts that seed into necessitates that the seed's gen DNA it has to grow because it's already programmed to grow if it sits in a particular environment. God has programmed you. He has placed it in your DNA to grow if you provide for yourself a particular environment in which to grow in. You can't help but to grow. See, listen here. If the pH of the soil is right, okay, if it had all the fertilizer and all the moisture it's in, and that kernel is healthy, okay, it cannot help but to grow. You know, I got trees growing in the cracks of things where trees are not supposed to grow. Okay, I, got, I had a tree one time growing into my house. That's because the environment in the corner of that house was ripe for that tree seed to grow. Okay, it couldn't help but to grow. Its DNA demanded that it grew. Okay, and you have within yourself a success gene that has to grow, but it needs the right environment in order to grow. Okay, and by the way, your success gene is different than my success gene because you're different than me. You were created special. Okay, see, listen here. See, everybody doesn't produce raspberries. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't produce oranges. Everybody doesn't produce peas. Everybody doesn't produce apples. Okay, every fruit for each person is different and your success don't look. That's why you're not supposed to look around. That's why the 10th commandment is there. You shall not covet what your neighbor has as far as success because your success is going to look different from your neighbor's success. Okay, now. How do you set that environment? See, the question that we need to ask ourselves. The question we need to ask ourselves is, uh, um, what, do we, it, what is it that we need to do in order to set our environment so that we can grow properly, okay? Our life is designed like a plant, 
When you place yourself in a successful environment, God will cause the growth. The true key to success is to establish habits that connect you to God and to get rid of habits that disconnect you from God. Once you are properly connected to God, you must grow in your success. You have to grow in your success. The universe is just set up that way. Even if you accidentally stumbled into the will of God, just like that tree seed accidentally stumbled into the corner or crack of my house, it, you have to grow. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let the words that I speak be seasoned with your things, oh Lord, that I choose to say, bring glory, not shame, to your name each day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let them bring you My name is Louis Merzone, and welcome to Northeast Bible Church, where we are a real family with real solutions, having a real experience with God. Since you're out there, do me a favor. I encourage you to let us know that you're out there by uh, engaging our chat and typing in your praise and worship of our great God this morning. Tell us how, say hallelujah, say praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, whatever you feel uh, is part of your worship experience. Now, would you please help me welcome our worship team. Well, God bless you this morning. morning. Northeast Bible Church, we welcome you to service on today. And we're just ready to give God some great big old praise today. Amen. We're going to pull out an old school. The Lord is high above the heavens, is he not? Yeah. Is God above the heart? Yeah. See, he sits high and he looks low. Come on, y'all. I'm gonna stop my foot like that a little bit. I might take these shoes off today. Haha, <laughs> bless you, God. Here we go. I say the Lord is high above the heaven. The Lord is high above the heaven. And his glory above the nation. God, your highest praise, acknowledge him in all your ways. Let all God's people say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Now give God some praise. That's it. Let's sing that one more time. And his glory 
It's time for us to worship the Lord in giving. Let's be reminded of what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians when he tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. And the cheerful giver is the one who purposes to give in his heart, uh, the one who doesn't give grudgingly or out of necessity. Uh, Paul goes on to encourage us and with, by revealing a promise that God makes to that, that type of giver, and that is that he will cause all grace to abound toward you in all sufficiency that you would have all that you need, enabling you to do every good work. All right, so let us stand on that promise as we, as we prepare ourselves for giving. You can make your contributions online by going to nebcfamily.org slash giving. You can also give by text. You can simply text the keyword NEBC dollar sign to 73256 to give. Thirdly, you can also come by the church Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. to drop off your gift. And lastly, you can send in your gift via the postal mail service. Now at this time, let me pray for your, the offering and your giving. Father, we are so grateful that you have given to us first. Father, you emptied the very wealth of heaven by sending Christ Jesus for us. And now, Lord God, we want to reciprocate. We want to demonstrate our love for you. Thank you, first of all, for sharing us, revealing to us what love is, that we would prefer you over the things, God, that, that, that you give us, that we would prefer the giver, the blesser versus the blessing. And so right now, in obedience, we give to you that that you have so graciously and kindly given to us. We ask that you would multiply it. We ask that you would bless it, that you would breathe the very life on it, cause it to go places, to do things that only you can cause it to, cause it to go and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, God. Hallelujah. So... This morning, I'm just going to talk to me because I know this doesn't apply to anybody else. But I'm asking God to take anything that's not pleasing to him all right, all right. out of me. Yes. Lord, I'm praying that you would have your way in this place. Yes. Have your way in the homes of every family that is here. Lord, we love you. We'll lay away every sin and weight that so easily besets us. Take it away. So overflow in this place. Have your way in this place. And we want more in this place. Have your way. This place have your way in this place and we want more in this place so have your way say overflow in this place have your way 
this place we want more in this place have your way sit again on the floor
take it out of me if it's not pleasing to you take it out of me have your way sing it real soft if it's not pleasing if it's not pleasing to you take it out of me if it's not if it's not pleasing to you take it out of me if it's not pleasing thing in your mind that you've been wrestling with that you've been struggling with you were saying God if you could just bridle my tongue oh God if you could just work in my mind that I might have might not have these unclean thoughts oh God that you could just help me to love my spouse a little bit better oh God if you could help me to yield when I need to yield to leadership oh God I'm asking that you would take those things out of me that are not pleasing to you Take those things out of me that are in opposition to your will, oh God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah, Lord. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Take those things away, oh God. Yes. And if you won't take them away, Lord, give me the strength, the courage, and the ability to lay it away. Thank you, God. To be able to lay it at your feet. Have your way in our lives, oh God. Because if it's not pleasing to you, yes, Lord. take it out of me. If it's not pleasing, oh God. I come humbly before you, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yeah. If it's not pleasing, if it's not pleasing, if it's not pleasing, have your way. without you Lord I don't want to talk without you bless you God I don't want to do anything without you I don't want to live without you oh God just have your way have your way Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another walk in the Word of God. Uh, I am so delighted to have the opportunity to come before you, and I pray that our time together is going to be fruitful and would bless you in your walk with the Lord. This morning, I want to spend a few moments in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to John, chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. And there you'll find these words. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Thus the reading of the Lord's word. Let us pray for a word uh, of power. God, we thank you that you are with us, that you see us, that you hear us. And even now, God, as we attempt to break the bread of life, Lord, we pray that you are with us and that you would take what we offer, multiply it among your masses, feed their minds and their souls. And God, we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, well, welcome again. I am again. Uh, it's a privilege. I haven't been with you in a while, and I am so delighted to have the opportunity to come and to share with you again. This morning, uh, I believe we have a special word from God, especially in these times. And so with that, I just want to uh, get right to the word and help you as you walk through life. These two verses... Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, 
If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Two short sentences, but such a profound, soul-shaking, life-changing statement. That's what I want to share in our time together this morning. For a few moments, I'd like to consider an age-old line with life-changing implications. The truth shall make you free. Can you say that with me? The truth shall make you free. Let's examine the hidden power in key words of this brief passage this morning. And I hope you're expecting to be transformed because we should never come into contact with God's word and not be changed. If we have time, I want to share a biblical example of how when the power of these simple passages is rightly understood and applied, it can transform a single life and impact those in your circle as well. But before we go there, uh, let me set the context so we can understand how this biblical principle can be applied in contemporary times. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment and acknowledge that we are living in unprecedented times in the United States and around the world. You don't need me to remind you of this global pandemic that has shut in families, shut out sports, shut down jobs, and shut up all the leaders we normally look to for answers, except for God. There's no way we can ignore the outpouring of protests against deadly police brutality, institutionalized injustice, and general unrest that has erupted in this country and all over this globe. Much is being said, and rightfully so. Daily demonstrations are taking place attempting to address the wrongs of a society influenced by a sinful past. As a human being, I feel the same outrage, the same sense of violation, and the same call to action. But let me be clear, I'm not a politician, I'm not a, an elected official, nor am I a legislator or a judge charged with enacting laws to enforce them. No, I'm simply a preacher called by God to equip his people to handle adversity through the power of his word. That's my purpose and my goal this morning. As I read my Bible, I am reminded that God has witnessed the most egregious display of human depravity in the callous crucifixion of his son on the cross. And yet he has a way of doing his greatest work in the midst of great trial and tragedy. With this in mind, I want to zero in on the word found in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 that we have already read. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here in two short verses, Jesus reveals something so simple and yet so profound. It's easy to read over it and miss it completely. But the first thing I want you to consider is he gives us the absolute key for a successful war in this fight for freedom. Look at it closely. Four times he uses the personal pronoun, you. This is significant because every successful fight for freedom begins as an inside job. Notice Jesus didn't say they. That's huge because if victory depends on your adversary, what he does or does not do, you've already lost. Don't get me wrong, change does require that others eventually modify their behavior. But here's the key that Jesus lets us know. The catalyst for change is in your own control. That's good news. God has already given you what you need to affect change in this world. The text calls us and it tells us you can make a difference. You can take action. You have the power to move mountains and you can initiate significant and lasting changes. You don't have to settle for injustice, second-class citizenship, 
or discrimination, but it all begins on a personal level. When I understand the change I'm seeking is up to me, the question becomes, what is the first thing I should do? Well, I'm glad you asked because the answer is right here in the text. Verse 31 tells us, if you abide in my word, listen, that's important. If you abide in my word, that raises a couple of questions for me. Who am I listening to? And secondly, how well am I receiving the message? Who am I listening to? And how well am I receiving the message? Your Bible, this verse is in red in your Bible. That lets me know that Jesus is speaking. But just for a point of emphasis, he says, if you abide in my word, listen, the Lord has the last say. He's the one who helps us when we don't know what to do. He says, if you abide in my word, that means he's the one I need to listen to. Then he says, uh, I should look at this word abide and understand that it means when I looked it up, church, it means to accept or to act in accordance with. That means I need to not only understand what he's saying, but I need to accept it and act in accordance with it. That's what abide means. This is important because if I don't stay focused on God's word, there's a whole lot of other voices which can lead to other choices. Listen, if you start drifting, you may get drafted. It's easy to begin with good intentions and end up in bad situations. Listen, my brother used to say, you have to stay close to the broadcast tower. You know how when you're traveling along and you're going, you remember the old analog signal, you would have your radio tuned to a certain station, and as you traveled along, you would listen to a radio uh, station, and the further you got away from where it was being broadcast, all of a sudden you started getting other voices. You get started getting interference. And one of the things that we have to know is that we have to stay close to the broadcast tower because it's in his word that gives us the power to survive. You see, when you begin to get out of range of that broadcast signal, you begin to hear other voices. And if you're not careful, you start making other choices. Choices that are not from the word of God. And if you want to win, you want to stay close to his word. Amen? All right, so second thing is, the text tells me, if you abide in my word, you shall know the truth. This statement gives me a God-given guarantee that if I fully accept and act in accordance with God's word, this guarantees that you shall know the truth. That's good news. I ought to say that again. You will know the truth. That's what I want to know. In a world with so much confusion, so much turmoil, so much dissension and division, I want to know the truth. Notice here, it didn't say my truth. Matter of fact, I have a little problem with that. I hear it all the time. People were saying, well, I want to tell my truth. But, but this uses the definite article. It says, the truth. That lets me know that there's a truth that's higher than my perspective. And I need to know what it is. There's a truth that is eternal, everlasting, without error, and is always victorious. Listen, if I'm leaning on my truth, I'm really leaning on my perspective. There's nothing wrong with perspective as long as I realize that my perspective can be faulty. Because like Psalms 51 and 5 tells us, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Proverbs 14 and 12 tells us, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. So if, if I want to know what is true, then I need to go to God's word. And if I go to God's word and receive it, and act on it, hallelujah, I'm guaranteed success. 
Now, I could stay there, but I need to move on to this word truth. What is truth? Pilate asked Jesus this question in John 18 and 38 when Jesus had said, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate was confused, and so let's see what the scripture says about truth. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus is offering his final prayer to the Father for his disciples while he was on the earth. And there he says this, sanctify them through your word. Your word is truth. Don't miss that. If you want to know what the truth is, is it the word of God? Also, it has the power to sanctify or to set you and I apart for the master's use. Do you want to be used by God? Listen, I know I do. Because I understand when I have leaned to my own understanding, my best efforts, my best understanding always ended up getting me in trouble. So I want to be used by God. God's word is the primary equipment we need to win in the war against sin. Not only that, but the Bible also tells us that what truth is. It also tells us who truth is. In John 14 and 6, Jesus clearly states, I am the way, hallelujah, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did you get that? Truth is a person. Truth has a being. And finally, if you read a little further in the same chapter 14, the Bible lets us know that truth is a spirit. John 14, verses 15 and 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see, I'm glad that he has uh, deposited the Holy Spirit in me. He said he would be with me and then he would be in me. That's important because I need him with me because there's always somebody out there that I've got to deal with. And when the Holy Spirit is in me, he helps me to deal with them in the right way. But more than that, he says that he will be in me. You know, sometimes our greatest enemy is not the guy out there, the woman out there, but it's the one that is where? That's right, in me. He helps me to deal with that as well. And so I can't lose with the Holy Spirit operating in my life. He has told us who the truth is, that the truth is his word, the truth is his son, and the truth is his spirit. Now, I don't have time, but careful study of your Bible helps us to realize that truth can be summarized in one word. Can you say Jesus? Hallelujah. He is the truth. He is God's word, according to John 1 and 1. He is who he claims to be in John 14 and 6. His spirit is the same spirit promised in John 14, 15, and 16. When we hear and adhere to his word, we live in the truth, and we're guaranteed victory. That's good news, church. When God is on your side, who, who, who doesn't matter who's against you? For when he's with you and for you, he's more than the whole world against you. There's one little caveat, though, that we, we've missed in this passage. Did you see it? Verse 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, the most important truth about the truth is it's only the truth that you know that will make you free. A lot of people like to quote that and say, the truth shall make you free. No, it's the truth that you know that will make you free. Don't miss that little conjunction in the front of that statement. There's a little three-letter word, A-N-D, between the cause of freedom and the result of freedom. 
It's worth repeating. It's the truth that you know that makes you free. Now, I love this word know in the Bible. In the Hebrew, the word know is yada. Perhaps the best interpretation of this word is found in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Let me read it for you. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. What's important to note here is the word knew is the same as know in the Hebrew language. It indicates the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman, the sexual bond. Its basic meaning is to quote unquote to know, but it could be translated and Adam experienced his wife. The point is that biblical knowledge indicates a level of intimacy that changes you. Did you see that in the text? It says Adam knew his wife. You see, when, when, when they became intimate, it says she conceived. And then she bore a change. And any, any woman that, that's had a child would tell you there's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. Do I have a witness somewhere? Yeah, there, there, there's somebody that understands that even though nothing has changed on the outside yet, you are still just as pregnant in the first few seconds as you are at nine months. And the good news is that once you're pregnant with the word of God, you may not see immediate results on the outside. But guess what? Just as sure as his word is true, you're going to change. And as you begin to develop and change, you're going to begin to see things begin to fall off of you. It's just like that, that nice young lady that, uh, you know, you, you really enjoyed your, your nice little outfits and all those things. But once you got pregnant, you know, it wasn't long before you had to set some of those things aside. And thank God one day you were able to get back to them. But same way, when we get pregnant with God's word, he begins to change us and expand us. Some of those things, those habits and hang-ups that we used to have, they just don't fit us anymore. And God begins to remove those things that would hold us down, that would shackle us in sin, that would hold us back. Because his word is working in us, and it's beginning to grow and bring us to the place of maturity in him. Thank God that he doesn't leave us the way that, we, that he found us. You know, some people say, well, you know, I had an experience and I, I found the Lord. No, no, <laughs> he found us. And when he found us, he welcomed us as we are, but he changes us through his word. That's what it means to, be, to know him. You see, the word of God physically uh, it has to make contact with us. It has to make spiritual contact with us so that we are changed. Did you, under, did you know you can be around the word of God? You can have it on your table. You can have it on your shelf at home. And it will never make an impact. You can come to church and half listen to the words being preached. And, and if it doesn't penetrate past the many thoughts that are occupying your mind, it doesn't impact you. But if you ever open up your heart and your mind to fully embrace and receive the powerful truth of God's word, you'll never be the same. You see, God's word is to your spirit just like food is to your body. It must be ingested, digested, and metabolized to release the full benefit and power of it. That's a whole other sermon right there, but I, I don't have time for that right now. But listen, when we become intimate with God's word, and his word penetrates a receptive heart, when we allow his word to govern our every thought and action, it gives birth to real freedom that begins on the inside, but radiates out to touch others. Let me share an example from scripture where we see this take place. 
If we go to John chapter 4, starting at verse 10, I want to read just a brief passage there to help us understand how this plays out in the life of a young lady who had an encounter with Jesus. John chapter 4, beginning at verse number 10. Verse 9. I'm sorry. We'll go back to verse number, um, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And if you look at it carefully, it looks like Jesus almost changed the subject. Verse 16, Jesus says to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For if you have had five husbands and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. But look, look, listen, listen at this. Listen how she responded. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You see, when she said, give me of that water, what she didn't realize was Jesus was offering her the spirit of truth. And what he began to do was he began to pour a little truth in to get a lot of truth out. I ought to say that again. Sometimes we have to pour a little truth in to get a lot of truth out. The first truth that we're faced with is the truth about ourselves. When Jesus asked her to go and call her husband, Jesus already knew that she had been married five times and was not living with a person she was married with now. But she said, I don't have any. Jesus began to pour. He poured a little bit of truth and he said, yes, you don't have a husband. You've had five and the one you're living with now is not your own. It's the ugly truth about ourselves that we have to deal with first. When he poured that truth in, look how she responded. Some people say the truth hurts, but this Bible says the truth shall make you free if you know it. We have a choice. We can either choose to accept the truth about ourselves or we can reject it. What she did was she accepted what he said. She said, I see that you're a prophet. That's the first step of being made free. We have to accept the fact, the ugly truth about who we are, about ourselves. But listen, it went on from there. She kept talking, and I tell you, if you keep talking to Jesus, he will keep talking to you. She kept on talking, and she began to say, Our father worshiped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming 
when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you know not. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You see, she was concerned about where she should worship. Jesus explained this, how you worship. She was concerned about where ship, and he was concerned about worship. When we understand that we, the truth of our service is, is about the condition of our heart as we serve, then it doesn't matter where you are when you begin to connect with him. Because God sees our heart, and he knows when we're sincere. Listen, the woman kept talking in verse 25. She said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Look at that. Look at it again. She says, uh, somebody else is coming. Uh, he's going to tell us another message, and it'll be at another time. Listen how Jesus counted. He says, I who speak to you am he. Beloved, don't miss it. Don't look for somebody else. Don't look for another time. And don't look for another message. He's already here. His spirit is available to us right now. And if we would receive that fully, his truth will make us free. This woman took that, those three things. And she dropped her pots and she went back to tell others about him. See, when you really get free, you're not concerned about who's, what your reputation was and, and who might uh, have negative things to say about you. All you know is that you have been changed and you want to tell somebody else about the goodness of the Lord. Those same people that she had possibly been uh, in sin with before, as she told them, they came to see for themselves, and they came to believe. Hallelujah. What a testimony of truth that makes us free. Listen, today, my prayer for us, as we go through these turbulent times, as we feel called to action, nothing wrong with doing those things that are peaceful and uh, letting people know that, that there are things that need to be corrected. But listen, go in the power of knowing who you are in Christ. Let him set your agenda. Accept his truth. Consult his word. Let him be the one who orchestrates and sends you as you go. For his power is the power that works through us. Ephesians 3.21 says that he can do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This morning, I pray that you will look at his word afresh. Study, let it saturate your soul so that you can be empowered to release the truth that you have received. Let me pray for you as we close this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in two simple verses, you have packed so much power. You have given us what we need for life and godliness. You have given us what we need to be victorious in the most difficult of times. And so, Father, I pray that this morning that we would adhere to your word, that we would study afresh, that we would renew our commitments to you. And then, God, as you direct us, we'll move according to your word. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. I have enjoyed being with you, and I look forward to the time when we can be together again. In Jesus' name.
God bless. Thank you so much, Pastor Peniman, for that powerful word. We appreciate your ministry. Now at this time, what I would like to do is I would like to offer you an invita a few invitations. First of all, I would like to offer you the invitation, the opportunity to become a permanent member of the family of God. Uh, the Bible is full of, of, of demonstrations of God's love. And so uh, what I would like to share with you is that God does love you. He loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to do something for us that we could not do. And that is live a sinless life in this human, in this human body. The Bible is also clear. It says when it comes to salvation that if you simply confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. And so it's a simple process. And I, don't, I hope that you would not resist the, the spirit of the Lord today and you would, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would accept him today. So if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your, as your Lord and Savior, you would simply pray a simple prayer like this. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that you love me so, that you demonstrated your love toward me by sending, to, sending for me Jesus Christ to do what I could not do. And that is live a perfect life before you. And today, I accept his sacrifice that I may become the righteousness of God. I place my faith solely in Jesus Christ as my Savior today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you made that choice today, I want to congratulate you. Please let us know by going to our website at nebcfamily.org and click salvation. If you would like us to pray for you, or if you would like uh, to unite with us, please go to our website at nebcfamily.org and click prayer request or join NEBC. That's nebcfamily.org and click prayer or join NEBC. Also, if you would like to speak to someone live right now, you can call 972-845-4900 and our counselors will be happy to pray with you, celebrate with you, and give you more information about Northeast Bible Church. At this time, we would like to share a few announcements with you. Hey family, it's Crystal Brown here. And guess what? It's officially summertime, y'all. And I know you're thinking barbecues and family gatherings are a thing of the past. Well, they're not. Why we should totally exercise caution using social distancing and wearing masks, because COVID is real, y'all. We can still connect. And I'll tell you how on this edition of our NEBC News. Connection is everything. We learned from the book of Acts that fellowship was essential to the early church community. And it's even more essential today. That's why we offer care communities, a.k.a. C-squared groups. These groups are designed to connect each and every one of us to one another. Groups continue to meet virtually online, and some are coming together in small numbers live and in person. You need to get in on this. These are groups for everyone. Singles, couples, women, men, senior saints, ballers, ministry-based groups, and more. And we just launched some new groups. Let me see. There is Playing for Keeps. Listen up. If you love to play cards and board games, a little friendly competition is good every now and then. So, all of you who were playing Phase 10, Spades, and Dominoes at the picnics last year, this might be the group for you. I think I might just check that one out. Kwana Young, that's my spade partner, y'all. Where you at? <laughs> and if you're a business owner or would like to become an entrepreneur, our kingdom-driven entrepreneurs group might be just for you. They come together to share tips and resources about business licensing, taxes, and more. Hmm. Well, I think I might just check that one out too. Are you ready to get your house in order? I'm talking about physically, mentally, financially, and otherwise. Well, the Wellness Revolution Group 
has you covered. Join this group if you want to really get focused and get connected. Hmm, I think I might join that one as well. Oh, don't laugh at me. You can totally be connected to more than one group. Go for it. The benefits are endless and it can be life changing. You should already be assigned to a group, but you join others by signing up in the RAM or sending an email to staff at nebcfamily.org. And might I add, these groups are not just for those located here in the Plano area. Our friends around the world are invited to join us virtually. Check our website, nebcfamily.org, to learn more. All right, family, be on the lookout for information on plans to return to our building coming soon. In the meantime, please continue to meet us every Sunday online for Children's E-Blast Adventures with Superbook at 915, as well as the Adult and Youth Services at 10. Get details and link on our website, nebcfamily.org, and see the bulletin on the NEBC app under Sundays for more about what's going on at NEBC. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on Instagram. And as always, live well, live right, and live forever. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We encourage you to join us here each Sunday. And remember, live well, live right, and live forever. Now let me close in prayer. Gracious God, we are so thankful that you have given us this privileged opportunity to gather in your name. We know that, Father, your word will not return to you void. We know that, Heavenly Father, you are doing mighty things, tremendous things, even miracles in our lives. And we thank you that, Father, you would give us that kind of attention, that you would give us that kind of love, that you would deposit that kind of energy, divine energy in us. And we are so thankful for that. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would cover your people, empower your people, keep your people, protect your people, and, of course, guide your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.